We're live! Oh my gosh. You guys, I'm so excited. I'm so excited today because we have the dark lord of vaccines. The person that the anti-vaxxers hate so much, and the reason they hate him is that he saves lives every single day through communication, through vaccine development, through science promotion, and through being an amazing superstar. Everybody, you're not gonna believe it, it's Dr. Paul Offit. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, I gotta say something, I gotta start at the bat. We spent about five minutes talking to each other, getting, we've never met. I've been a fan of yours since 2010 when I made my first vaccine video, and I Googled, hey, actually I wanna tell that story later about how I was vaccine hesitant after my kooky neighbor, this was in the Bay Area, was like, you know that vaccines are associated with autism, man. And I just had my kid. And I was like, wait, what? I'm a hospitalist, right? I don't vaccinate babies. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I went down a Google hole and I saw a very attractive woman by the name of Jenny McCarthy telling me that uh, I was killing my baby by giving vaccines. And then I saw a, a less attractive woman uh, named Paul Offit, <laughs> who happened not to be a woman, saying, no, 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 no. Here's the science. And it was your persuasion that made me look at the primary data and realize, okay, I get it now. Not only are they safe, they're effective, they're one of our great advances. And so having you on the show today, I want to talk to you with our audience about how we can better communicate. Because you have a book that came out that I had the pleasure of reading before it came out. And I, the whole time I'm turning the pages, I'm like throwing feces because I'm so angry or excited, and that's what I do because I'm a monkey. And I was like, this is a handbook. It's bad advice. Why celebrities, politicians, and activists aren't your best source of health information. It's a handbook on how we can better communicate in a sea of Gwyneth Paltrow's, Jenny McCarthy's, Donald Trump's, the science denial all around. So let's start with, why are you such a shameless shill for Big Pharma? You know, I saw you pull up in an Uber that looked like a Honda Civic, and I'm like, that's a lie, all right? Um, I'm not a shill for Big Pharma. I, I was fortunate enough to work with the team at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that developed the strains that became the bovine human reassortant rotavirus vaccine, Rotatec, um, which was licensed for and recommended for use in all children in this country in 2006, and then for the world by the World Health Organization in 2013. I mean, the, the um, only pharmaceutical companies have the resources and expertise to, to do that, to do the research of development. So, wait, 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 wait. So, so, so Logan Stewart in the back there, in a meth <coughs> lab, can't just create a Rotatec uh, rotavirus vaccine. No, it's a little hard to make hundreds of millions of doses in your lab. Uh, you don't know Logan. <laughs> All right. He broke bad in like 1992. This guy's had a lot of bragging. So, so I think this point of like, yeah, you have to work with a Merck to make a vaccine that's scalable to actually get to lots and of And the people. minute you do that, you're a bad guy. You are. There's, there's no way to answer that question. I'm, I'm asked that question. I was asked that question by Matt Lauer on Dateline NBC. I was asked that question. That by, guy's a pervert, by the way. By Steve Colbert, Stephen Colbert. Less of a pervert. Question. I mean, yeah. it's, and so, you know, you're... Um, the, the, the minute your name is associated with a pharmaceutical company, you're, you're, you lose now. The, the truth of the matter was, I was always funded by the National Institutes of Health, but, but the fact of the matter is, I was, the, I was a patent holder on something that became a vaccine. Now, 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 I'm the intellectual property of my hospital, therefore the hospital really owns the patent, but it, yeah. it does, you get tired of explaining it. it. It never convinces anybody anyway, because you worked with a pharmaceutical company, therefore you're evil. Wait, 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 look, look at this. It's an anti-vax protester. <laughs> oh, is that okay? Yeah. Wow. You know what's amazing? Wow. So, see, this is this is amazing. Really? You can't see them in the on camera. Yeah, so, yeah. guys, guys, Z Pack. Wait, that's really true. Yeah, yeah. there are actually this is not, a, not a joke, Paul. This is not a joke. Not there a joke. are actually anti-vax activists outside the window right now. Wow. And now they're gone because Tom turned them off. This is what we want to talk about too. You hear him? Yeah. What is he saying? Is that I can't. I don't know, but Tom's gonna make sure that uh, the door is locked and also that Logan's gun is cocked. I'm going to. You hear him? Yeah, yes. Z yes. Dog. So Paul, yes. let's get into this because I think this is fascinating. Because you created a vaccine in partnership with a pharmaceutical right? You're now a target of parents who think that we're causing harm with vaccinations. You spend 25 years of your life developing a vaccine that saves lives, that, that saves, I think it's been estimated, hundreds of lives a day because rotavirus kills children. 
you do this, you're a passionate advocate for, scientists, you're, for science, you're a pediatrician, you're a good human being, you're a lovely introverted person who in five minutes I, I loved talking to, and you get this as a reward. Why? Well, it, it's, I think, um, I'll give you a story. When, when I, I, I was asked to speak once at, um, to a group of legislatures in, in New Haven, Connecticut, yeah. and, and after I was done speaking about this, about whether or not vaccines could cause autism, uh, a woman came up to me who was the mother of a child with autism and yeah. just started screaming at me yeah. at the top of her lungs, screaming. And it always gets to me. I never get so thick skinned that this doesn't bother me. It bothers me. Like yeah. these guys are bothering me. Yeah. Um, and and the, the state senator who gave me a ride to the to the train station to go back to Philly said something I'll never forget. And it's true. She said, "You know, you've gotten to the center of things when you meet the very best people and the very worst people." And I think that's happened to me. But but I also have had the good fortune to meet some of the very best people. I mean, people like like you, people like Peter Hotez, who's the father of a child with autism, who has who deals with the financial and emotional burden of that and still puts himself out there. I know Sharon Hummus. I mean, uh, Amy Pisani, Kirsten Thistle. I mean, there's so many good people out there trying to do good things for all the right reasons, and I had the good fortune of being able to meet them. So I think I'm lucky. I think I'm lucky in all this. You know, I, I love the way that you are able to, to, to bring positivity out of what is a very challenging situation because, you know, I read your book, and there are stories in the book that are really uh, dramatic about how you've been trailed and harassed in public. Um, threatened with death threats. How many confirmed death threats were there? Three. Three confirmed. Now, one of the things you taught me in the book, which I had to learn because I get, I get death threats through it too, um, is in order for a threat to be considered credible, it has to be, um, it has to be specific. So like, this is how I'm going to kill you. It has to be repeated more than once. And it has to have some plausibility. Was that the third? It has to be a, a person who, who the FBI thinks could do it. I see. Uh, so like a paranoid schizophrenic. Right, so someone who's a little bit off, like this guy, who then could theoretically do that. So I think Tom's speaking to the police right now because right. we are trying to do a show and luckily Logan is armed, so <laughs> just so they know that um, because we're in Las this Vegas. This is an open carry state. This is an is open carry state Great. and Sorry. Logan, is a, uh, <laughs> Logan is a, Logan was raised from very young learning gun safety and, and, and uh, hunting with his dad and that sort of thing. So. In the book, too, you talk about kind of how we've, as scientists, your first chapter is like how scientists are just terrible communicators. Like you, you, one of the funniest things in the book, and the book is very funny, by the way, and, and I remember you'd ask me, is it funny at all? I'm like, dude, it's hilarious. Like me and my friends are laughing because <laughs> you said the difference between a scientist who's an introvert and a scientist who's an extrovert. A scientist who's an introvert stares at their feet when they talk to you. A scientist who's an extrovert stares at your feet when they talk to you. <laughs> and that's spot on. That's spot on. And so how is it that someone, again, like yourself, who is deep in the science, 130 publications on vaccines, how is it that you're able then to become a communicator in a way that puts yourself in this kind of space? Um, for me, it was, on the one hand, I think I saw how hard it was to make a vaccine. It was a 26-year effort uh, ending in a prospective placebo-controlled 11-country uh, um, four-year, $350 million trial to prove that a vaccine wasn't what it was claimed to be. And, and, and so that it was safe and effective. Mm. So while that was happening, I also watched how, how, uh, seeing how hard it was to make them. At the same time, I saw how easy it was to damn them. When Andrew Wakefield published his paper in The Lancet in 1998, claiming that the MMR vaccine caused autism, it was not a study. It was just a case series of basically eight children who got autism within a month of getting the vaccine. I mean, he might as well have published a paper showing you know, eight children who, who got you know, leukemia and, and the month before that had eaten peanut butter sandwiches. Really, it was that Four level lame, that lame, of, of, yeah. of, of uh, sophistication. But, and, and then people made in, in the United Kingdom made the choice not to vaccinate their children. So thousands of people got measles and, and hundreds were hospitalized and four children died. Four children died in a sense because of that paper. I mean, that was a wake up call to me that, that we as scientists have to be willing to stand up and get in this game of explaining why, not, not only that it doesn't make sense, but why it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, address the science of why his hypothesis never made sense. And, and when I did that, um, I was a bad guy to some people. I was a bad guy. Sure. To some people, I was a good guy, but to some people, I was a bad well, guy. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, and again, I don't want to blow too much smoke up your butt, but because you get so much hate, but the love that you get, when I told my friends who are in pediatrics in particular that you were going to be on the show, they, it was like, 
a deity came down from on high and, and it, because you were so revered for standing up for children. And that's really what it is. You told a really funny story in the book too because you've been on Colbert, you've been on Daily Show. The story of being on Colbert. Uh, do you want to tell that story or you want to save it for the book? No, no, sure. It's um, funny. So, so it was, uh, so the second time I was on Colbert, the last question he asked me was, um, so it's out there in the pocket of industry, how do you respond to it? And I say, you know, at Children's Hospital Philadelphia, we're, we're not in the pocket of industry. If anything, we're in the pocket of children because we do this and this and this. And Colbert, um, uh, and so people booed. People booed loudly. And it's about 300 people in the studio audience. It's, it's a little unnerving to be booed loudly by 300 people. So um, I, I guess the associate, so, so the way that ended up was he, he's a good guy. I mean, he, he, he knows science. His father actually was infectious disease immunology person in, in South Carolina who died when Colbert was only 10 years old. Mm. But he was, uh, so he's very much pro-science. And right. so he didn't want me to be booed on national television in front of millions of people. So he said, that's not the answer you want. We'll try it again. He asked it again. I said, so the second time I said, you can't on the one hand praise vaccines for being safe and effective and not praise those who make them safe and effective. And then I did something you're specifically told not to do. I looked at the audience. I said, was that any better? And everybody cheered. <laughs> and, and so then the way they edited it, because it's not a live show, it's live right. tape, as they say. So it was, um, you see me say something nice about vaccine makers and people in the United States cheering on national television, which has probably never happened before. When I was walking out, I asked the associate producer, why did people boo? And um, she said, you know, people like you don't realize it's a comedy show. And when you said you're in the pocket of children, it made you sound like a pedophile. <coughs> so and, uh, I remember <laughs> driving to the uh, train station that night, because this is in New York, we're going back to Philly. My wife and daughter were with me, and I said, you know, would you ever ima have imagined that? And my daughter said, yeah, I imagine that. That's why I booed. <laughs> so you, my daughter. you got booed by your own daughter. How yeah. old are your kids now? So they're 26 and 23. Wow. So are you are you worried about them with all the sort of hate? And I, I don't think so. Yeah. I, I really don't. I I, I choose to believe um, that that most of this people in, most people in this world are good, and yeah. they they see the good in in my children and me, and I, I choose to believe that. But yeah, they're always going to be the people like the people outside that are knocking on that, that right, class. right, who are now gone because the police have been called. But you know, actually, I want to I want to dig into that a little bit because. There's a humanity here that I think we often miss when we make an us and them. And you and me are good at, uh, I think, polarizing people in that sense because we are so passionate about, again, be not being in children's pockets, being on children's sides and saying, you know what, we know we have our own kids, they're fully vaccinated, we've been through this, we've studied it. Unlike what the anti-vaxxers say, we've actually had quite a bit of training on vaccine science, on immunology, and we want to do good in the world, and no good deed seems to be unpunished. And then when we see people denying science, the Jenny McCarthy's, the Goops, the Gwyneth Paltrow's, the Donald Trump's, you, 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 you say, and regardless of what your politics are, you can say, you know, that science denial is not okay when the science is largely settled. And the, the, the question then is, the anti-vaccine people, the mothers that you talked about who have children with autism who are suffering, they're looking for answers. How do we love and have compassion for them without getting triggered and angry? Because even in your book, you said at one point you lost your temper and you got angry in a debate and that was a bad idea. Yeah, I, I, I guess uh, I feel an enormous amount of sympathy for, for parents who, who you know, have to struggle with, I think, difficulties of a child who's on the spectrum. I mm -hmm. think that's true. I think it's emotionally burdensome at some level. It's financially burdensome. I get that. And, and I think people want answers, and there aren't answers. I mean, there, aren't clear, there isn't a clear cause. There isn't a clear cure. So it's really frustrating. Mm -hmm. And I think the sympathy, that, what makes me most sympathetic, is that I feel, I feel like they've been duped. You know, that people like Andrew Wakefield or Jenny McCarthy have duped them into thinking that, that this is the answer, that, that vaccines were the answer. And therefore, if, if they don't vaccinate their future children, that they, they won't have to suffer this. And that if they try and figure out, you know, what they can do to sort of detoxify whatever it was that toxified their children, like chelation therapy, which, you know, some people offer. Right. That or that, bleach that's, enemas. That's, that's, that's or, right. Yeah. And that's going to make them all better. And it's just, I, f I feel they've been duped. I, I feel enormously sorry. I, I had to speak... Um, at a Bryn Mawr uh, library a couple nights ago, and, and there was a woman who actually drove up from Baltimore, and she really wanted an answer. I, she wasn't angry. She, she felt that her child had gotten a vaccine, actually a DTAP vaccine, it had been hurt by that vaccine, and now he's autistic, and can't we just do something to find out what happened? And, and I, I talked to her for some length of time, trying to explain to her, because she felt it all happened within minutes of getting the vaccine, right, which just right. doesn't make biological sense. Right, right. How it's, it's uh, I don't think- But it makes emotional like, sense, Paul, right? No, no, I know. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, that's what Jenny McCarthy says. My yeah. child got the vaccine, and within moments, quote, the soul left his eyes. <laughs> right, you know, right, Vaccines right, don't right. work that fast. Right. Um, but, you know, 
know, it's you want it. You want to help her. You do want to help her. And the only way I can think to help her is to say, I don't think this is it. I, I don't mm -hmm. think that the vaccines are your answer. You yeah. know, so. But 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 you know it's I mean I make the analogy for example for type one diabetes in the 1800s type, no one knew what caused type one diabetes so there were all these sort of wacky kind of causes and wackier cures and right. and then Banting and Best discovered insulin in 1921 and all that went away and I feel like we're always going to be living with this until we have a clear cause or causes for what is autism or autisms and have something more that we can offer other than behavioral therapies other than long term therapies which is not terribly satisfying people want something to make it go away. And I think people like Andrew Wakefield or Jenny McCarthy or Gwyneth Paltrow offer those kinds of magic cures, and, mm -hmm. and it's seductive. It is very seductive. I guess one of the things, because you, you'd actually uh, donated proceeds from one of your books to an autism foundation. Is that your foundation? Or? Well, so I, I was one of the founding advisory board members of the Autism Science Foundation. Got Allison it. Singer runs that foundation out of New York, and it's just a great foundation. I mean, it's the only autism foundation with the word science in the title, and, yeah. and they really try and, and understand largely sort of the genetics of autism. Right. And, 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 and that will help. See, I think that will, what I love about Alison Singer actually, so she has, her eldest daughter is autistic and fairly severely autistic. And, and, and so she, she now has created, she devotes all her energies to, to what is clearly a long-term solution if it's to be a solution at all. Yeah. So, so what are the genetics? I mean, what gene or genes are expressed early in the first trimester, the, the developmental genes that, that could explain the, what, what we see as autism? Because you do know that at least first trimester environmental factors like, for example, thalidomide or mm. rubella, natural rubella infection or valproic acid an anti-seizure drug increases your risk of autism. That's interesting. What's happening then? And that's, you know, what, what gene or genes are affected by the, these environmental factors or, or, or just genetically involved? I mean, it's, uh, paternal age is clearly a risk factor. I mean, when Donald Trump has a child on the spectrum and Robert De Niro have a, has a child on the spectrum, it's because they were roughly 60 years old when they had their children. Mm. That's probably the reason. And so mm. what is the genetics of that? That is understandable. It's not going to be a single gene mm -hmm. like cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease. <coughs> It'll be multiple genes, so it won't be easy, but I think it's understandable. See, that, that to me is, is, um, <coughs> is, the, is one of the great tragedies of being on this goose chase with vaccines, which we've shown time and time again. Again, the multiple studies you predicted back when this started, that studies would show that this wasn't the case, and that proved true. Now, so much effort in, in parents' communities are spent, you know, thinking about vaccines as a cause when it's all those things you talked about and probably much more that, that are leading to uh, diagnoses of autism. One of, the, one, of the, one of the big controversies that comes up, is autism an epidemic or are we diagnosing it better? And where, where do you kind of fall on this as a pediatrician? I think we certainly have far more awareness. Mm -hmm. I mean, what used to be sort of primary autism has become autism spectrum disorder. So it's right. a much broader range of activities, and we're certainly more aware of it. And I do think there is, an, uh, we are older when we have our children now as compared to, say, when my mother and father had me when they were in their 20s. Um, right. <coughs> sorry. So I think that all contributes. So I do think there is actually a, a real increase. It just doesn't have anything to do with vaccines. Right, right. And again, I want I want to apologize to you because we, we you literally, you flew from Philly through Charlotte to here, got right off the plane, got in the Uber, came right to here. Tomorrow you're doing a talk and you've been busy. This morning you did grand rounds at like 5.30 a.m. Pacific time and you've been busy, busy, busy and I'm sure you're exhausted. So the fact that you care enough about talking about this stuff and listen, it comes through from the second I met you. I expected actually, if I'm being honest, I expected this kind of asshole that you see in the media who's just like, screw these anti-vaxxers and this is how to, but that's not what, the first thing you said to me is I feel really, really bad for parents of children with autism because it's so hard. And, and, and that, that to me is I think what a lot of the public misses uh, that doesn't understand what you're doing. And, and I think it's the same with, you know, when you talk about pharmaceutical industry, people, people like to vilify pharmaceuticals and I do too. I like to vilify the marketing guys, I like to vilify the business guys, I like to vilify the fact that it's very expensive and it shouldn't be and so on. But, but, the people on the front lines who are doing the research, working with the pharmaceutical companies, are heroes. It's plain and simple. And every time I've talked for them, I've said, you know what, you guys, you know what you're doing. Every day you're trying to help human beings. You're trying to relieve human suffering. And, and this is the goal. Now the question is, how do we better communicate what we're doing to the public when you have celebrities who are very good at communicating, who maybe even have good intentions? Like, I'm not sure Jenny McCarthy has had evil intent doing this. I mean. Wakefield I worry about. I, I feel like there's something going on 
whether it's like a narcissism or some ego thing. And, and I think you might have mentioned some things in the book, some speculation about what you might think. But we, we can't know because we can't know another person's mind. But how, in the book, I think the main premise of the book is here's a manual for how we can be better at communicating without getting so emotional, but without ignoring emotion, because it's important. You know, when those guys are banging on the door, I started getting emotional. I started saying, you know what? Let us speak. This is your chance to talk to people. And why would you shout somebody down? It means that you're so emotional yourself. You're suffering so much. Think about the kind of suffering that that guy has. If you really feel what he feels, he is so angry because he thinks we're harming children. So I can actually have a kind of cognitive empathy for that and understand that. But the question is then, how do we transcend that and actually better connect with these folks? And I think the book is very good at that, but I want to hear what your thoughts are. I think you do the best you can. I mean, you, 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 when, when I speak to parents, which is almost daily, they call me on the phone, I try and understand what it is that concerns them about mm -hmm. vaccines and then try and explain how there are, and invariably are studies that sort of address that concern and, and to do it in a, in a compassionate and passionate um, and, and empathetic way. Uh, and uh, you, you do the best you can, realizing that there are people who will see you as evil. I mean, there were, there were a few parents, actually, uh, that were anti-vaccine people, parents a couple nights ago at, at that Bryn Mawr Library. And, mm. and the, the, I have an enormous amount, it's easier for me, I guess, to feel compassionate for people who aren't screaming at me and telling me I'm an evil person. Right. You just lose it. Or the person who puts a camera in your face and, and, you know, and doesn't tell you they're filming you. I, that, it just, it's a, that's upsetting because it's not fair. I mean, I, I just, I think as, uh, I think, I think we are going to know much more about science and medicine a hundred years from now than we know now. There's no doubt about the fact that we have much to learn. But there are things that we do know. I mean, specific germs cause specific diseases. We can prevent those diseases. I think raising the question, you can argue in the best case scenario, Andrew Wakefield raised the hypothesis. Does the MMR vaccine cause autism? That's an answerable question. Yeah. And it's been answered again and again and again in 17 studies in seven different uh, countries on three different continents involving hundreds of thousands of children and costing tens of billions of dollars. The, the, the public health and academic community responded to that concern. What upsets me is when people don't realize that, when they say, well, it's just all, it's just all a conspiracy to hurt children. So Paul, I think what, what it is there, and this has been my experience with this, is that there, we, we have this paradigm on the show, you've probably heard of it, the elephant and the writer. So the elephant is our unconscious limbic emotional system. It's pre-wired, it's, it's, it, it's some of its genetics, some of its conditioning, some of its education, some of its religion, politics, et cetera. And then we have this little writer, our cortex on top, writing on top of the elephant. And that's the one that's supposed to do science and be rational and be persuasive and, and use words. Use your words, you're talking to the writer um, when the elephant's stomping. <clears throat> I think the issue with some of the anti-vaccine sentiment, and the reason it's so intractable, is that their elephants really innately distrust uh, government, industry, et cetera. And that's, for whatever reasons, they're conditioned to, to feel that way. And there is an element of like, well, whose fault is this now that this has happened to my child? I need something. To, to, to peg this on, and that's their elephant. So when you present data, well look, here's all the data that says it's not vaccines. They move the goalpost, or they confirm their bias with data that, that is not well done, and that says, well maybe, 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 and any little thing, they'll go through it. Confirmation bias, all the logical flaws we talk about. Now, they are human beings. We expect them to do that. How do we combat it though? How do, because we know, we know from the data, because we, we can be a little more dispassionate about it. And they'll accuse you, they'll say, well you're a shill for pharma, and you're getting paid for it, so, how can you be dispassionate? Well, there are millions of pediatricians, thousands of pediatricians around the country who are not getting paid by pharma, who lose money on vaccines, who believe so strongly in it because they've looked at the same data. And, and actually, this is, a good, this is a good chance for me to tell my quick story. Again, because this show's all about me, Paul. Even though I'm Paul, <laughs> and I'm like, let me tell you about me, Paul. So in 2009, I'm just about to launch ZDog MD Industries. Uh, it's as a cry for help for my burnout. I'm making videos to try to draw attention to the suffering we have in healthcare as caregivers. And my neighbor, we have a fence that's about this tall. It's, it's in California. He comes over, he's a financial planner, very, very intelligent guy. His wife's very intelligent, lovely kids. He came up to me and said, you know, I know you're about to have a baby. Uh, actually, it's mine in 2007, but you're about to have a baby. Are you gonna vaccinate the child? Because I heard all this stuff that like, the vaccines now are, MMR in particular is associated with autism. And I said, I hadn't heard that actually, because I, it's just not something that ever came up in my practice, because I take care of adults. And um, <clears throat> I graduated med school in 99, just when Wakefield's paper was coming out, and I, I didn't see it. So 
immediately I was like, well, that sounds plausible because there's been all this people talking about autism and, and, and it seems like it would cause an immune response and maybe there's some adjuvant or there's aluminum or mercury and I get online and I go down the rabbit hole. But because I'm a doctor, because I've been trained in immunology and I'm trained in the scientific method, I could go through and sort through the garbage and get to the truth. And some of it is going to make sure I know credible sources, understanding the methodology. And I was able to answer the question, which is, nope, they've shown it's not the case. Whew, because I don't want my kid getting measles, mumps, or rubella. Because as a kid, I, my parents saw that stuff because they're from India. And I have this vaccination scar from smallpox. And I, 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 I think we can prevent, this is one of the great public health triumphs of our era. So that's how I came to it. But how does someone without those tools come to that decision? Do they have to rely on a Paul Offit to write a book? Do, how do we do this? So I think, it's, I think it's fair to be skeptical about anything you put into your body, including vaccines. And, and, and it's easy to see where this comes from. I mean, we ask, children in, ask parents in this country to um, vaccinate their children in the first few years of life with vaccines to prevent 14 different diseases, which can mean as many as 26 inoculations during those first few years of life, which can mean as many as five shots at one time to prevent diseases most people don't see, using biological fluids most people don't understand. Mm -hmm. I think it's perfectly easy to understand how we got here. I mean, you didn't have to convince my parents to be vaccinated. They were children of the 20s and 30s, they saw diphtheria as a killer of teenagers. They saw polio as a crippler of, of, of young people, including mm -hmm. young adults. You didn't have to convince me. I was a child of the 50s and 60s. And so I had measles, I had mumps, I had rubella, I had varicella. I knew what all those diseases felt like. But my children who were in their 20s, they don't see these diseases. Now, they didn't grow up with these diseases. For them, it's a matter of faith. So I think it's, yeah. fair, to be, it's fair to be skeptical. That's okay. Mm -hmm. and, and so, so now you're, you, just, you want to be reassured that, that this is still necessary, that all these vaccines are still necessary. And, and, and so then how do you get that information? This is the hard part because... Because if, for example, I'll have someone who will call me up and say, look, I've done my research on the chickenpox vaccine and I've, I've decided not to get it. But, but what do they really mean by research? What they really mean is that they've looked online mm -hmm. and read people's opinions about the varicella vaccine. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you really should do if you want to be, have an informed opinion about the varicella vaccine, roughly read the roughly 300 articles that have been published on the varicella vaccine, which would require an expertise in microbiology and virology and epidemiology and statistics, which most people don't have. And frankly, most doctors don't have. Yeah, that's true. So, so what do they do? I mean, they rely on those advisory groups that at least collectively have that expertise, collectively have read those articles and make recommendations which they think is in the best, best service of the children in this country, like the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices to the CDC or the Committee of Infectious Diseases for the American Academy of Pediatrics. And those groups have served us well, but sell that message in the 21st century. Trust us, we're experts, we know what's good for you. Yeah. That doesn't work. Doesn't so work. I think you have to give people, as best you can, the information they, they need to try and help them sort through this stuff, sort through what they're reading on the internet. But at the very least, it seems to me, you know, that if you're looking on the internet, I, I can tell the difference between sort of good sites and bad sites. Like, yeah. First of all, the good sites generally aren't selling things like <laughs> cures for autism. Like Deepak Chopra's <laughs> weird, like, radio camera thing for meditation. You know, right? some, uh, something that'll rearrange the ions in your brain you know, right. to make your autism go away. This right. is this right. be a clue. So trying to sell you something, but then they'll say, well, but you're trying to sell me a Rotatech vaccine, Paul, so what's the difference? Well, what would you say to that? Well, I mean, first of all, I don't sell it. Merck sells it. I, I don't make a penny off of the sale of the Rotatec vaccine, so we're good. Um, I, I, I w have not been compensated in any way for that vaccine for, for the last 10 years, so it's, Got it. I'm, I'm out. Got it. But early um, on, you probably had licensing fees or inventor's well, fees. Yeah, so I, I'm, a, I'm the intellectual property of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Oh. They own me. Um, oh, therefore, right. they do the deal with Merck. Therefore, they get the money from Merck. Got um, it. And then, then I am part of their patent policy, so I get a certain percentage of that money. And if you want to know what the percentage is, it's the, the three inventors, me, Stan Flacken, and Fred Clark, I'll split 10%. The hospital gets 90%, we split 10%. Got it. That's it's the typical I mean. devil's deal you make with academics when you, uh, right. It, 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 the, 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 the motivation for doing the work on the rotavirus vaccine and the reward from doing, from doing the work on the rotavirus vaccine were never financial. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was great. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that things are a little easier for my family, but that certainly wasn't the, the reason to do it. Uh, because who does it for that? I mean, who goes into, goes into science and thinking, God, if I can just figure out which of these two viral surface proteins evoke neutralizing antibodies, I can be rich. I don't think people think that. They shouldn't mm -hmm. because they're, they'd be idiots too. They would be idiots. There are much easier ways to get rich. Really, really, a, a, blo a blockbuster statin would make you a lot yeah. much more money. Launder money for Russian oligarchs. I've done yeah. that. It's very lucrative. That's how we paid <laughs> for all this opulence you see right here. Well, but so that gets me to the point. So people who do things for money, Dr. Oz, 
Um, how do you feel about these guys, the Oz's, the Chopra's, the, you know, the Dr. Phil's, et cetera? In your book, you mention them in passing, saying when they say something that's you know, kooky, people tend to listen. When we say stuff, everything's met with questions. Yeah, I, th I think w what, and I think Dr. Oz does say some good things about your health. So I'm not trying to, and he certainly is a mainstream doctor. I mean, he's, he's a cardiovascular surgeon at, at, at Columbia. He's a full professor in the Division of Cardiovascular Surgery. I mean, he, he puts people in heart and lung machines and heart, holds their hearts in his hands and fixes them. So he certainly buys into mainstream medicine. I think what they do, and it, 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 this is the part that bothers me, I think, I think that medicine is uncertain. It is. We, we are going to know more in the future than we know now. There, we only know so much of the puzzle when we're asked to make a decision. I think if you ask people, are we going to know more about your health a hundred years now, I think everybody will say yes, but when it comes to their disease, they want to believe you know everything you need to know right now, even though you don't. Yeah. And I think what, what, what Chopra does, and what Oz does, and what the Andrew Wakefield does, is they, they're gurus. They're yeah. sort of all-knowing. It's yeah. what I call in the book sort of the, the Bones McCoy seduction, right? I mean, but the, you know, the chief medical officer of the USS Enterprise had his tricorder. He just scanned you up and down, and he looked, and that's what you had. And there's something very reassuring about that. I think that's what makes Andrew Wakefield so reassuring. He's, he knows that this is true. He knows the MMR yeah. vaccine caused autism, even though study after study has shown that it, that it doesn't. That's reassuring in some ways. I get nervous anytime someone says they know know what the problem is and whether you know it doesn't matter who it is even if I agree with them like if Bob Lustig says sugar is a toxin and he's absolutely certain about it then I have to sit back and go could it maybe not be a toxin <laughs> you have to question these things even if they're right and I, I think I think that's I think that's the main thing I, you know someone like Chopra like he's from a spiritual side sure let him do his thing but when he starts talking about you know cortisol levels and things like that he, he says it with again with a certainty that then it, it fools us, actually, because we're looking at, as much as we hate authority in this space, we want authority. And what I've found is I think people want to know, what would you do for your kids? And so what I do is, I, just the other day, I took my two kids, uh, 10 and 7, to Target, and we got flu shots. And what lit the fire under me was the story of the first flu death in a child in Florida mm. uh, last week. And we went, I videotaped it, I put it out, it got a million plus views. Probably 30% of them were from rabid anti-vaccine people who were just furious that I was poisoning my children. But the rest of people were like, oh, I didn't realize it was so urgent. I'm going to go get it done. And we know the flu vaccine isn't as effective as a lot of other vaccines. We know this. We'll admit it right up. We'll say, no, even if it's 30% effective, it's 30% effective that you didn't have. And the flu can be fatal, if not just for you, then for those who are vulnerable. So it, it's more, it, it's a mix of selfishness and altruism when you get a vaccine. You don't want to get sick, but you also don't want to make others sick. And you want to do your part for community immunity because we need a certain critical level. And I think that's starting to erode now when we're questioning experts and the death of expertise and that kind of thing. Um, what I like about your book is you kind of go through it and like, here are all the mistakes I made, Paul Offit made, when I started doing this. I would go on these shows and I would give a list of all, here are all the indications, you know, <laughs> just shoot all at the writer and not motivate the elephant, not be simple, not come from a place of, of love and compassion. And then you learn, and it's nice to see the progress on how that, how that played out. Do you feel that in your own career? Sure, I mean, I, I think, um, yeah. I, I actually, um, for me, the, the passion, I guess, in all this is that we all have our biases. My, mine is that I work in a hospital, so there's not a year that goes by at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia where we don't see a die, child die of a vaccine for an Die of vaccine for You're still seeing it. Sure, and, and, and it's, it's flu being the most typical. Yeah. And during the pandemic year, we had about five yeah. deaths. But, you know, you, you know pneumococcus, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, pertussis or whooping cough occasionally. So, and invariably, it's because a parent made a choice not to vaccinate, or in the case of pertussis, not to vaccinate themselves when they were pregnant. Mm. And so, and why did they make that choice? They made that choice because they were persuaded by bad information that caused them to make a bad decision that ultimately hurt their child. And I think that's what I always have in my mind. I mean, it's always that story that I have in my mind. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, just within the past uh, couple of years, there was a child who came into our hospital whose parents had recently converted to Muslim. They had vaccinated their two older children. They decided not to vaccinate this, this child. Religious not, exemption. Not that there's I mean. anything in the Muslim religion that says right. don't get vaccinated, but this was their decision. So, gotcha. And so we saw that child in our clinic <clears throat> at two, four, and six months of age, and at least 
tacitly agreed because there is a religious exemption to vaccination in, in the state of uh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And at 11 months of age, the child was infected with a strain of pneumococcus uh, that was contained in the vaccine, that would have been prevented by the vaccine, had meningitis, uh, but inflammation of the lining of brain and spinal cord, causing the brain to press down on the brain stem, which is, say, herniated. And we intubated him and saved his life, but he will never see or walk or speak or hear again. And it's, it's a perfectly normal child who could have lived to be 70 or 80 and been a, a happy, productive member of society who was felled by this awful decision. And you know, you, you, and so when you hear people give bad information out there, you always have these images in your mind. And I think that's what makes it so passionate and so difficult for me, I think. That's why sometimes I get angry when I get on these shows and people are giving bad information, because I have those images in my mind, because I work in a hospital. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I don't think you'd be a human being if you didn't get angry about it. I think it, 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 it both helps us and hurts us when we get emotional about this stuff because people see that we're human beings and that we feel strongly about it. I think this idea of what would you do for your loved one is actually more powerful than we accept in medicine. I think there's a stigma against telling patients, this is what I do for my mom or my kid, this is what I did for my dad, and especially at end of life, but particularly with kids. And so I've tried to make it a thing in this show to like say what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Here's me getting my shots, here's my kids. When she gets, when, when, when my oldest gets her HPV shots, she's 10, she's gonna get it at 11, we're gonna, live stream the whole series and talk about that. Because that's one of those, that's a great one where people really don't realize that you can prevent cancer, not just of the cervix, but potentially of other areas. We've done several shows on it. Yeah, I mean, one third of the cancers is caused by HPV occur in boys and men. Boys and men. Right. And, uh, and the rest occur in the band of Boys to Men, which is an amazing R&B group <laughs> out of Philly. Do you huh? see what I did there, people? <laughs> this is why I'm Z-Dog MD and you're not world, all right? Now. So, so I, I do have some questions because I think, you know, we're, we're about half, half an hour in. We have 1,600 people watching live. There's a million comments. Angry emojis, happy emojis, love emojis. This is the tribe. And I want, I want to help them be able to talk about this more effectively. I want to influence moms and dads on the fence. And I don't want to attack anti-vaxxers and I don't want to say, I don't want to ad hominem them because I'm good at that. I do that really well. That's one of my things, Paul, is like <laughs> you get to try to be professional. I just get to be a dick. And, uh, and it feels really good. But, but then when I go to bed at night, I think, am I helping things? I'm rallying our troops. Maybe I'm swaying someone on the fence, but I'm just entrenching their elephants in hating me and hating science and hating what we do. So maybe there's a better way that I need to explore and I need to say, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong on this. Right? Feels good, but it's probably wrong. Let me ask some questions, because I think I, think I want to get at some of the science, because you're, you're the expert on this, whatever the anti-vaxxers say. The mercury thing, why is it bullshit? So, um, the the... The um, ethyl mercury is a preservative that's contained still in some multi-dose vials of influenza vaccine. Um, when, we, when you put a vaccine into a multi-dose vial, you have like 10 doses per vial, um, the rubber stopper gets violated again and again, and even though you keep the vaccine in the refrigerator, you know, four degrees centigrade, the bacteria and fungi can still grow. Mm -hmm. So what happened when you gave dose eight, nine, or 10, 70, 80 years ago, is that you would inject children inadvertently with skin bacteria like staph strep, which would cause local cellulitis, local abscess, or worse, you know, bacterial sepsis and death. And so you need to have some preservative if you're gonna have a multi-dose valve. Right. Hence, ethyl mercury, which is a bacteria static agent, meaning it, it, it decreases the ability of bacteria and fungi actually to reproduce. So because it gives them autism, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and so, Ethyl mercury was contained in a number of vaccines. As we started to give more and more vaccines and we were given more and more ethyl mercury, it sort of raised reasonably raised concerns. Are we doing more harm than good? Now sure. and now what we knew what we know now and frankly we knew then is that that if you if you live on the Earth's cr surface, which pretty much everybody does, um, you are going to be exposed to mercury. I mean, mercury is part of the Earth's crust. It's inorganic mercury. As it comes to the surface, it gets uh, taken up by bacteria on the surface of the seas or on the surface of, of soil and methylated. So now it's not uh, inorganic mercury, it's organic mercury, it's methyl mercury. Oh, now, so it's organic, bro, so it's all good. Is that what you're telling me? I could sell it at, at Whole Foods in the non-GMO <laughs> organic mercury section? I don't even know what organic means anymore. It used to mean carbon containing. Okay, right. so right. in any case, the, now the mercury can cross the cells and do harm, and certainly methyl mercury can do harm. I mean, there's, you know, mercury at high levels, methyl mercury at high levels can, can be toxic to the central nervous system, to the brain. So, and we see disasters, the Minamata Bay disaster, the Iraqi fumigate 
devastating grain disaster are examples of how high levels of mercury can cause harm. So the question reasonably is, can these much, much lower levels of ethylmercury in vaccines cause harm? Yeah. Remember that, that um, and so, so it's, it's you, you, assuming you live on this planet and you drink anything made from water on this planet, including breast milk or infant formula, you are exposed to far greater quantities of methylmercury than mm. you're ever gonna get from ethylmercury in vaccines. And if you look at children who are inoculated with ethylmercury in containing vaccines, you can't tell that there's an increase in the level in their bloodstream of mercury because we all have mercury in our bloodstream. If, if you live on this planet, you're gonna have mercury in your bloodstream. So I mean, I have had to testify in front of congressional hearings where congressmen will say things like, you know, when it comes to mercury, I have zero tolerance. We've had zero tolerance, move to another planet. On this planet, there's mercury. <laughs> Ironically, move to mercury mercury where there's less mercury <laughs> on the show. No, and that, that, that's exactly it. So, of course, it's been taken out of most vaccines, actually that's at right. great cost, because now you can't have a multi-dose vaccine. You have to have individuals, and it costs a lot more money. So you've charged a little more to do that, but they've done it just out off pure public relations, really. Yeah, I think I think we um, th this, this sort of the the public health service made the decision to do this. I think mostly because uh, their idea at the time of community that was it that all risks, all theoretical risks, should be communicated. I'm not sure yeah. why that was the decision, but and so so we spent uh, tens of millions, probably hundreds of millions of dollars, really now moving from from uh, multi dose vials to single dose vials. About 50 percent of the, the cost of the vaccine is actually in its packaging. So yeah. that we did we did. We spent a lot of money and didn't make vaccines safer. And, and one of the things, if you look back at that, what they said at the public health service at the time, they said, you know, uh, all the evidence today does is suggest the notion that mercury at the level of containing vaccines is unsafe, but to make vaccines, safe vaccines, even safer. Well, if it didn't make it unsafe, then taking it out never made it safer. It just made it perceived to be safer, even though it wasn't. Right. It was, it was not us at our best. So this, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what, also speaking of that then, you're talking about additives and unsafe things in stuff that you consume the supplement industry, you've written a book on that. So this is another spectrum of the science, right? So in supplements, you have no idea what's in them. <laughs> They're not FDA regulated. Um, and yet people would sooner take a ton of supplements than vaccinate their child. Explain the sort of thinking there. What yeah, it's a sort of magical thinking. Yeah. It's the notion that the, the that when you that first of all the supplement, as you say, the dietary supplement industry is not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, not in any effective way because they don't have the manpower to do it, and so therefore you don't know that what's on that label is actually what's in that bottle. Mm. You don't know whether it's made under good manufacturing practices. So, mm. we've dealt with that at our hospital. I mean, I'm the head of the Therapeutic Standards Committee, so we deal with this all the time. What do we do? I mean, the Joint Commission of Hospital Accreditation said, you know, if you're going to give this, you have to record it and you have to store it. And and you have to give it. So we did that initially, but then we realized somebody say wants to give their child selenium 40 micrograms a day. So we would write the order out and we right. would give it. Well, first of all, we didn't know it was 40 micrograms. We didn't even know there was selenium because we don't know because it's a, it, we feel like we were, be, we were participating, frankly, in a fraudulent industry. Yeah. And so we stopped. We yeah. stopped doing that. And now you have to sign a form that we're not going to give it. If you want to give it, you can, but realize we don't know what's in it. It may interfere with other drugs you're getting in this hospital. But you're right. I think people walk into the store and they think this is somehow much more natural. You know, this is being made by elves and old hippies on flowering meadow sides, and you know, this is, it's only gonna do good and can't possibly do harm which right. is true of nothing. I mean, right. if something nothing. has a positive effect, it can have a negative effect. That's always true. But somehow this industry manages to skirt that. It is remarkable to me that they've been so successful at it. And it's a great counterexample to the vaccinations. Here we are studying it, purifying it, 12,000 degrees of safety measures, studies, et cetera. In including the vaccine safety data link. I mean, once a vaccine is made and is put out there, there is a link computerized medical record system so that you know who's gotten a vaccine and who, who hasn't. Yeah. And if there's anything that shows up it'll show up quickly. It's too bad this doesn't exist on the drug side. Right. I think if this existed on the drug side, you would have seen Vioxx as a cause of, a rare cause of heart attacks much quicker. Earlier than Topol uh, pointed it out. Yeah. Eric Topol, yeah. right. Yeah. Eric's my homie, by the way. Duh. I like to name drop Paul, because like you're a famous dude. I'm like, Paul, you know, me and Eric were chilling the other day just talking about Vioxx. And, uh, but so, so yeah, so supplements, but then here, here, related to that, what's wrong with our media? Why is our media not portraying science in a way that is helpful to the public? Because in the book, you talk about that quite a bit. Everything from false balance to the idea that they like clickbait titles to, you know, I mean, w what's going on with the media? I think for the most part, the media doesn't portray science at all. I think it's sort of uh -huh. dropped out of, uh, it's very, the CNN has, has, I think, dropped its science and technology se section. The Boston Globe, which is at the heart, in many ways, of the biotech industry, has dropped its science and, and says mm. now it's like a health section. So. Mm. Um, I think generally it's not portrayed, but you know, the, 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 the conflict of interest, if you will, is that the goal is to sell advertising, and you sell advertising if you're interesting, it's much more interesting if it's controversial, and, and it's a man bites dog story. Mm. 
Yeah, and, and it's frustrating because I feel like here we have a platform. Yeah, there's uh, 1.6 thousand people watching. This will get a ton of views when it's done. These are engaged people who can comment in real time, can ask us questions. Way more elderly die from not being vaccinated and being exposed to influenza than from vaccine-caused deaths, says Jenna Smith-Sanders. So people can leave, they can leave their feelings. In the media, I feel like, um, you know, the physician voices are glossy and they're soundbited and maybe that's what the public needs, but I don't think so. I think the public wants to hear doctors talking about this stuff, honestly, like they're talking- That's why what you do is so important, I think because you are a great communicator. I mean, it's, but it's so rare. Think about how rare it is. I mean, that for doctors to do the kinds of thing you do, we're not trained to do it. We're generally not good at it. It, it. We're used to, you know, because the scientific method really doesn't allow you to ever prove never, we tend to always sound like we're waffling or worse, covering something up. I mean, it just doesn't come off well. And you know, it's funny because you see, in the old days, I would have thought you were all, you're just blowing smoke up my ass, Paul, but no, you're absolutely effing right. <laughs> doctors are the worst. And every time I get one on my show, I fear that the show's gonna be a disaster because they are, they're so, they'll pull back, they, 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 they're very reserved, they're worried about their professional appearance, they're worried about saying the wrong thing, they're worried about taking too much risk in what they say, and it comes off as they're hiding something or they're waffling or they're not being transparent. Right. And my job, which is hard, is to try to pull them out. With you, see, it's interesting because even though you're an introvert and you're a scientist, you've done this enough now that you give of yourself truth that comes out of you. And whether you disagree with it or not, if you're an anti-vaxxer, you're gonna disagree. But it is authentically you and you can tell. You're not holding anything back. You're not you know, prevaricating. That's a fancy way of saying lying. It's an SAT word. Thank I you. looked it up. And, uh, and, and so I think that we need more Paul Offits in the world communicating science. Bill Nye is a great example of a great- He's, he's great. Great science yeah. communicator. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think, is great. Oh, he's amazing. He's, but you gave, a great, you gave a great example in the book of, of a Neil deGrasse Tyson <laughs> F-up, where, okay, uh, it was- um, uh, Titanic. Uh, Titanic came out, and he puts out a tweet or some public statement like, you know, the stars in the North Atlantic don't look anything like that that time of year when in they were looking at- In 1912. In 1912, because he's got like some, he's like, Oh, no, no. Orion would have been in here. And uh, people ripped him a new one. They're like, listen, Poindexter, uh, it's a frickin' movie. Don't nerd out. They don't realize scientists are passionate about truth. That's right. And he couldn't hide it, and he had to say it. And now, do you think that was a mistake, or do you think it just No, showed? no, I think that's him. I mean, that's he, him. he said, wait a second, whoa, whoa, hold it. You know, it's probably, of the 400 million people that saw that movie, he's the only person who said that, but still. <laughs> Stood up in the theater. <laughs> you know, I have a funny Carl Sagan story. All right, so I saw Carl Sagan at Fresno State University. I grew up in Clovis, California, Central Valley of California. In um, high school, I was a big nerd, of course, <laughs> everything. And uh, listening to Rush, playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, Carl Sagan comes to town. And I'm like, my buddy gets me tickets. And my buddy's the guy who wears the Iron Maiden t-shirt and is like, yeah, but he's a super nerd. So we go see Carl Sagan and I'm just waiting. I'm sitting in the back, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. He says, billions and billions, which is his catchphrase. I stand up and I'm like, what, billions and billions? I start clapping. Dead silence in the rest of the audience. All of them scientists, nerds, and I'm just like, hey. <laughs> but see, if, the public got as excited about science as the scientists actually internally do. Yeah. I think we wouldn't have climate denial. We wouldn't have vaccine science denial. We wouldn't have the mess that we're in. There's this movie out now called Science, an Indian movie called Science Fair. I don't know if you've seen it no, yet. No, I haven't. It just came out, but it, it's, it's about these high school students who are competing for science prizes. And they do exactly what you say. They're, whoa, whoa, let's, you know, this is, a, they're screaming for each other. And it's just like the ones that have won, it's like they just won the Nobel Prize. They're very emotional. So something happens, I guess, <laughs> between that exciting time when you're, when you're younger to when you get older that you sort of repress some of that. But it's there. I'm telling you it's there. It's just a matter of getting it out. <laughs> Let me ask you, so speaking of communication, does shame work? Is shaming somebody for not vaccinating, is that an effective story? No, I don't think so. I, I, think, I think you have to understand that it's really hard to watch your child get so many shots at once. It I know. doesn't make sense. I mean, here your child's two months old and they're getting five shots. And, and for what? For polio? I mean, uh, is there still polio in this country? Diphtheria? How many cases of diphtheria? Is it tetanus? I mean, it's really hard to watch that. I get it. I get how, how you're, you're sort of put off by that. But, but a choice not to get a vaccine is not a risk-free choice. I mean, it's, it's not as risky of a choice as it was 50 years ago, but it's still a risky choice. You're still playing at some level a game of Russian roulette, and you just have to find a way to say that, that you know, that, that 
our job as parents is, mm. to, is to put your child in the safest position possible. These are well-tested products. This, this has a, you know, this one based on a mountain of evidence. You know, feel comfortable with this. Mm. Try, let's find a way you can feel comfortable with this. But I get, I get the pushback. Yeah, I, th I think we do need to re-explain ourselves. I mean, you didn't have to explain vaccines to my parents. You didn't have to explain vaccines to me. I had most of these diseases, you know, and I had polio. But I was, you know, I was born with club feet actually, and was in a polio ward when I, after following surgery uh, when I was five years old. So I certainly remember what polio looks like. Yeah, and, yeah. And I mean, I have a friend who you know who suffered polio, who's you know still having post polio syndrome. So I I see all that. Um, so, so, but, but today it's, it's so we do need to step back and re-explain ourselves a little more it, because it's not as compelling. The diseases aren't quite as compelling as they were. Yeah, interesting story around that. So uh, speaking of shame and, and our platform. So there was a nurse in Texas, you probably heard this story. She uh, was on a Facebook anti-vaccine group and had written about a patient who was there, violated HIPAA about seeing measles. And what I thought was interesting, and I did a show about this where I said, you know, it's inexcusable to have a healthcare practitioner violating HIPAA, but then also being able to see measles in an ICU setting, see the child suffering, and still say, I will not vaccinate. Because again, the science is there and then the emotion is there. Now, what was interesting though, Paul, is in her actual post, she said, you know, guys, this is really bad. Like, this is awful. What I see here, this is much worse than I thought, and it really had me shook, but I'm not changing my anti-vaccine stance, but I'm just saying, and I feel like that was very powerful, actually. But it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that, that this surprises her at some level. Like, yeah, it does. whoa, of this course. is really bad. I mean, when Jenny McCarthy says, uh, you know, I'll take the frickin' measles every time, as if it's the choice between getting a measles vaccine and risking autism or getting measles, which she sees as benign, it tells you that not only have we largely eliminated measles from the United States, we've eliminated the memory of measles. Right. I mean, measles makes you sick. I mean, 50% of people who have measles actually have abnormal chest x-rays. They may not have clinical pneumonia, but they have abnormal chest x-rays. I can tell whether somebody has measles in 30 seconds based on how sick they are. Yeah. Um, and they call old people like me down to the emergency department when kids come in with fever and rash because I'm so used to, I, I saw so much measles, you know, in training. How, how, how comfortable are you with your own immunity and titers that uh, hang around measles kids? Well, I had measles. Oh, you had it? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm of an age where I likely, I was born before 1957. Oh, got it. So you cheated and got measles. <laughs> so you're saying, so, okay, I'm just going to go on record here and say, Paul Offit says, have a measles party, everyone. <laughs> That's how you natural immunity. What's wrong with natural immunity? Chicken pox party. What's wrong with that? Right. So, so, so um, the goal of vaccines is to induce immunity um, that's, that's, that's acquired after natural infection without having to pay the price of natural infection. So, so you could reasonably ask this question. Isn't, let's take the measles example. Isn't it true? I mean, I was naturally infected with measles. Isn't it true that after being naturally infected, mm. infected with measles, I probably have higher frequencies of memory immune cells, B and T cells, than does someone who was vaccinated. Yes, I do. That's yeah. true. Because yeah. you probably, had a bigger antigen response. Yeah, I, yeah. I, and my, the virus reproduced itself thousands of times in me, and not you know, the, the 10 or 20 times it is when you get the vaccine. So, so I have a much greater immune response. It's true. But, but the question, so say, why not? Well, then why not have natural measles parties? I mean, because if you're going to get a better immune response, that's not the right question. The right question is, is vaccination good enough? Yes, it's good enough. We eliminated measles from the United States by the year 2000. The only reason measles has come back is because now enough people are choosing not to get it. So you want to make sure you can get immunity that is close enough to natural infection to prevent the disease, which we did with, with the measles vaccine, without having to pay the price of natural infection. Chicken pox parties, really? I mean, <laughs> you know, chicken pox can kill you and did. I mean, I've seen it, yeah. 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 So, so that's the downside of a chicken pox party. Right. I mean, you're talking about what, meningitis, pneumonia, what are some complications of chicken pox? Yeah, so well, the, big, the, the ones that got most kids into the hospital, it would be about 10,000 admitted a year before the chicken pox vaccine, which was in 95, is they would get skin infections which because the blood blisters oh, yeah. would burst in that and the big one was necrotizing fasciitis oh, wow. you know which Neck could cause from, yeah yeah loss of limbs now imagine so this was 1995 even that mm -hmm. recent that chicken pox was causing 10,000 admissions that's right a year and about 100 deaths a year and 100 deaths and i remember yeah, I was most in previously healthy people that's children. the thing these aren't like immune compromised children right. they're not yeah so so again these are tremendous advances hpv vaccine what do you say to parents who and and this is this this is one of the frustrating things that triggers me a little bit and again i should be less emotional about it but i i'm not that guy i'm not a great scientist i'm more of a emotional communicator and i love medicine and i love people and and there's there's love but not I, it's hard for me to get rational sometimes HPV, we have nurses in the audience, we have um, uh, very educated people who say there's not enough data, 
it causes terrible side effects. There's these girls in wheelchairs now, and I'm, I believe in vaccines, but I don't believe in this one. What do you say to that? Well, first of all, it is the most studied vaccine post last year. It's been formally Thank studied you. in more than a million people. And so that's number one. Number two is, if you had to ask the question, which vaccine preventable disease kills the most people? The answer is flu. And so there's, you know, the, the last year in the United States, we had 80,000 deaths from influenza and, mm. and almost 200 in children, mm. um, most previously healthy. So, so that's number, what's number two? HPV. Yeah. HPV, the current vaccine, the, the HPV-9 vaccine, Gardasil-9, will prevent 29,000 cases of cancer every year and 5,000 deaths a year. That 5,000 deaths is more than all other vaccine preventable diseases with the exception of flu combined. Yeah. <coughs> No, no, that's okay. Take a, take a break, man. You've been talking a lot. You just got off a plane. I'm going to grab some comments here while you're doing <coughs> that. Um, what, again, was the death rate with measles before the vaccine, Brandon Leo says? Right, so, so before the vaccine, there were about three to four million cases a year, U.S., 48,000 hospitalizations, about 500 deaths. 500 deaths a year of children. Think about that. That's a Primarily life. Children. That's a life that doesn't happen. You talk about quality-adjusted life years. When, when a child dies, it is 80 years of life, quality of life, weddings that are lost, right? It's not like we're talking about a 75-year-old person getting a Shingrix vaccine and not getting shingles, which is still important because it can be debilitating, but it's a very different thing. Um, let me see here. Uh, Bonnie says, bless you and your integrity. No, my wife's name is Bonnie. <gasps> That's my Maybe it's Bonnie. Name, no, I'm... it's not Bonnie Offit though. It's <laughs> Bonnie Heaton. <laughs> I would stack it with, with family, too. Um, I don't think she knows that I'm, 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 this is live. I don't, I'm not sure she knows this one now. So. Oh, yeah, that's probably for the best because uh, <laughs> the live comments. Are, these are actually really good comments, Paul. Like, um, thank you, Dr. Paul Offit. So sorry to hear about your experience in a polio award and having clubfoot. Thank you for sharing, Kelly. This is the thing, Kelly, like, you know, I think one thing we don't do well as doctors is humanize ourselves. I think a lot of times we're supposed to be these superhuman detached agents, brains and vats that say, uh, vaccines are safe and effective. And people go, I don't resonate with that because that's not how we're tribal creatures. We don't have somebody in the tribe who's the poindexter who goes, well, according to my data, and no one's going to believe that. So that's why I like, you know, I really like, and this is the thing, it, i got to be full disclosure here. Paul did not ask me to talk about this book. He sent it to me as a courtesy so I could read it, and I loved it. And um, I love it so much that I think, actually, and, and here's my honest feedback. I think it's great for lay people, but I think it's even better for medical people because medical people can go through and they go, God, when I have to deal with these questions, I get so triggered, how do I deal with it? Here's a great way to think about it. And it also really, I think it puts into place how celebrities are damaging our understanding of science. It's really damaging public health. And they may not be intentionally doing it. People like Robert F. Kennedy Jr., like this guy's a lawyer. What is he talking about vaccines for? Uh, he has the World Mercury Project. I think he's trying to drum up business for a class action lawsuit, to be perfectly honest mm -hmm. with you. He's, um, he is of counsel to the law firm of Morgan & Morgan, which is a big class action litig litigator. And so maybe he's wagging that's, the dog. Maybe that's, I don't know. I, 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 I don't get it. I mean, it's, it's fair to ask the question. I mean, mm -hmm. mercury is never going to sound good. It's not like there's a National Center for the Appreciation of Heavy Metals standing up in defense sorry, of mercury. Sorry, you're absolutely wrong. Heavy metal rocks and Freddie Mercury is the shit. All right, <laughs> number next, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, so um, he, it means, again, it's fair to ask the question. I mean, wait, you're injecting children with mercury, what? And so, and so fair enough, and, and it has been answered now in, in seven studies, and it's exactly what you would expect given that they we're exposed to far more mercury. There's more mercury in this than you're gonna get in vaccines, but not in that. Um, okay, good. Mine's clean. All right. It's just because um, you, you backwash. Because you're a mercury <laughs> factory, Paul. Because you work with vaccines for so long, you're tainted. Yeah, so, so, so Robert. Yeah, so, 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 and so, and so the studies have been done. And so why isn't he convinced by that study? It's, it's okay to be skeptical. I just, it, when you cross the line into cynical, that's when you lose me. You said that in the book. I thought that was great. Skepticism is important. It's part of the scientific process. Right. Exactly. Skeptics is a good thing. I mean, I'm here actually for the, the Center for Skeptical Inquiry. It's a group of skeptics like Richard Dawkins and Stephen Pinker and Steve Novella. I mean, these Stephen Fry. I mean, these oh, are... Oh, man. I want to crash that party. How come I never get invited? Come on. Come I'm, on over. I'm so skeptical. I'm <laughs> too skeptical to show up. I'm like, I don't know about these guys, man. <laughs> so, so, so skepticism is good, but cynicism. 
is bad. This idea that everybody's out to hurt us, there's a big conspiracy. Look, money is, is a big driver in healthcare. We talk about it on this show all the time, trying to build health 3.0. You're in the academic silo, Paul, so you see part of it, but the true dysfunction out in the community is so hurtful that I think until physicians are able and, and frontline healthcare staff are able to overcome their moral injury of practicing in a system where they feel like they're causing harm, deep down, uh, gonna, it's gonna be hard for them to advocate and find the time to go on the news and talk about these things, you know? Be better communicators. They're hurting themselves. You know, they're inside, they're hurting. So this is, this is a real problem. You know, but they call it burnout, it's moral injury. And, and I think it hurts even more when now our patients question everything about us in a cynical way. So skeptical is fine. I love it when patients question what I'm doing. Right. Because I feel like then here's a chance for me to explain and make, make sure they know my thinking because that's shared decision making. As opposed to, I don't trust you, man. You probably paid off by a big pharma, bro. And so, so you've lost. You've and lost, so yeah. You've lost. There's nothing you can say because you're all part of the, you're a part of the conspiracy. That's right, and the and chemtrails. So, and so you bail. Um, and so, so I, I bail on those. I say, is there anything I can say that will help you with this? And if the answer is no, then why have the discussion? Yeah. I, I mean, this was, a, there was the, a person who sort of confronted me at this meeting a couple of days ago. I mean, I, she asked a question about aluminum. And so I was trying to explain about the, how aluminum works, how aluminum is the most abundant light metal in the, in the, on the planet. And we're exposed to aluminum in a variety of ways. And so here's how, is, is if you're injected with aluminum versus if you ingest aluminum, how does that all work? And she just wouldn't believe me. And, and mm -hmm. after a while, I just said, why are you asking me yeah. questions if you're not going to believe anything I say? What's the yeah. point yeah. other than to torture me? I think, <laughs> was the point. <laughs> I think her elephant was really, she knows what it believes. And no matter how you try to persuade her little rider, it's not, it's going to reinforce what her elephant believes. And this is a struggle, Paul, because we're human beings and we evolve not to seek truth, but to seek validation in our social tribe. We, 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 we seek persuasion in our tribe because that's how we survive. We can transcend that, though. That's the beautiful thing about being human. We have the brain structure to actually go, no, I'm better than that. I can take a space. Whether it's just meditating, whether it's paying attention, whether it's working on yourself, whether it's going to therapy, we can do that. And that's where I agree with like people like Deepak Chopra, where they're good at being a guru is where they say, you know, we should just step back and say, let's look at ourselves. And so there's some beauty and truth to be found in all these sides, even in the anti-vaxxers, because at least they have forced us to question things, confirm what we know through science, and then bring it to the public. And so for that, I'm grateful, I guess. For the rest of it, they can go to hell. You know, I, I, think, I think that if there was not a formal anti-vaccine movement, there would always have been an anti-vaccine sentiment. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is you, you aren't compelled by the diseases in a matter that I was compelled by the disease or my parents were compelled by the disease. So I think that would have had to have happened. The mm. people would say, wait, why are we giving all these vaccines? They don't even see these diseases anymore. And we're starting to see an increase in chronic disease because, frankly, we live longer. And, and mm. could those two things be related? I think it would happen without, without the Jenny McCarthy's or the J.B. Hanley's or the RFK Jr.'s. I think it would have happened anyway. Yeah, I think you're right. We got a little hater here, Lynn Waldrop. You are not evolved, nor do you meditate. <laughs> you don't know me. Lynn, okay, um, actually this is the worst time to meditate <laughs> when you're like highly emotional and charged. That's like, oh, okay, well, actually, you know what? You can step back and see that as a, as a kind of an experience within your awareness. Anyways, now I'm gonna make Paul uh, off it into a practicing Buddhist with me right before he goes to a skeptic conference and everyone <laughs> makes fun of him. Uh, Paul, any, any last sort of admonishments, because we've come up on an hour now, and I want to respect your time, because you have to get up at the crack of dawn, and you've been traveling, <laughs> and you've given so much of your time here, even to so these guys pounding at the door, and Tom, did we end up, what ended up happening? I called the cops. Called the cops? They're in jail. Are they really? They got I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad. See, this is, I'm, I'm not a big gun person. I don't like guns. Has this happened before? Uh, never. Really? Yeah. Wow. Uh, this is a first, and I suspect that you were like um, Looney Bait. So it, it actually brings it. Now, oh, I'll tell you a quick story that may relate to this. So, and, and it relates to something you said in your book. Your hospital, Children's Hospital of um, Philadelphia CHOP, and your organization, UPenn, have been very supportive of the work that you do because science and you care about children, and they know this. Um, but there have been, um, you know, there, there are times when you can say stuff that will upset your employer, et cetera. Now, we did a thing where we did flu shots. Uh, we got live flu shots. We did a live show like we're doing now at our hospital in uh, yeah. Las Vegas, our county hospital, where I'm on staff where I round, where I know the CEO, I'm friends with everybody there. And they said, sure, CVS won't let you get a live flu shot. They're too risk averse. Come over, to, they wouldn't let us do it. 
the pharmacist said, mm -mm, we're not comfortable with w that. What weren't they comfortable with? They weren't comfortable with us live streaming us getting flu shots. Because? I guess they were worried about liability if like giving a shot wrong on TV or something. You know, every, every other National Foundation of Infectious Diseases gives, li gives flu shots live on television um, so at, at, at DC. Let me say this, so CVS, bad, shame on you. However, Target, which is CVS, let us do our kids. So it's always a little soft, but so UM, our UMC, our hospital had said, sure, uh, come in and, and, and do it there. And so we did the live thing, everybody got vaccinated. They, were, they, they made it a thing to vaccinate all the docs too. And we made a couple jokes about, I think Tom, I said, now Tom's about to get his vaccine, prepare to become severely autistic Tom. And I said something like, it'll be an upgrade for you because you know, you'll actually be uh, better at, at uh, helping me out. It was a dumb joke, probably in poor taste, but it didn't occur to me at the time, it's a live show and we were trying to be funny. And um, the anti-vax people seized on that joke, not on the fact that you know we're getting flu shots, we're trying to prevent disease. They seized on that and they made so much trouble for the hospital that the hospital had us pull the video down. Hmm. I never pull videos down, Paul, ever, ever. And I did it for my hospital because I love and respect them, but I still think it was cowardly. Uh, and, and I understand why they did it, because of the joke that we made, and that I understand. But the truth is, we need to stand together as agents of reason and, and people who care and say, you know what, we, if we have a united front on this and we support each other in communicating and our institutions support us, we'll be much more successful than if they treat Paul Offit like a rogue agent for saying we should do the right thing for children. No, I, I would say in defense of my, my hospital, has, I have not made things easy for my hospital. I mean, <laughs> by being sort of a lightning rod, it, right. it'd be much easier for them if I didn't do this. They have consistently stood by me. I mean, yeah. um, and our hospital, you know, mandates flu vaccine. I mean, if you, if you don't, it, it, starting in 2009, if you didn't get a flu vaccine and you, you were an employee of the hospital, I mean, you could, could walk into the room. So not just doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners, but you know, dietary services, environmental services, anybody who would walk in the room as a healthcare employee, um, you had to get a vaccine. If you didn't get a vaccine, you had two weeks of unpaid leave to think about it. If you yeah. still didn't get a vaccine, you were fired. Yeah because we made that decision for our children because it, it, we're responsible for the children in our hospital. Right. Occasionally, influenza is transmitted in the hospital. Occasionally, it's transmitted by healthcare workers. And, and we have a lot of children in the hospital who can't be vaccinated for obvious reasons because yeah. they're getting cancer chemotherapy or whatever. Right, right. No, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, 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 so I'm glad, I'm, I want to give a shout out to CHOP for, for supporting you. It's a really big deal. Um, UPMC's decision to give flu block, the egg, uh, egg-free flu vaccine the recombinant for older, DNA vaccine. Yeah, yeah, the recombinant, recombinant one. W w what's your thoughts on that? Is that something that we ought to be doing? Or? No, I think it's interesting. The, the flu is elusive, yeah. this puts it mildly. I mean, it is a moving target. So, so every year it mutates so much from one year to the next, we need to give the yearly vaccine. And, and I'm actually on the FDA's uh, vaccine advisory committee that actually makes a decision about which strains are put in there. So we oh, so sorry, decision. sorry, just substitute FDA for Illuminati, and I think we have the answer there, <laughs> right? right? Mm -hmm. So lizard Illuminati, I think that probably works. What was that? Lizard Illuminati. Oh, lizard, right, yeah. that's the best kind of Illuminati. Anyway, so, so, so we make that decision, it marks for what goes in in September. And, and it, so it, it depends how the virus moves. I mean, so you, it's all these sort of not just types like H1N1 or H3N2, but there's these subclades. So it's really hard. And usually it comes up from South America, but sometimes not exactly. And, and so in 2014, 2015, we missed. I mean, the, the strains that we had in there, specifically the H3N2, had that virus had drifted so much so that it didn't cover it at all. So mm. that's the second thing it does. But the flu, but to answer your flu block question, this is a sort of a little complicated, but the when you make this vaccine in eggs, you grow the virus in eggs. So, mm. so the virus actually can drift a little in eggs. Right, as it's uh, yeah. replicating. Whereas that doesn't happen with the recombinant right. DNA vaccine, nor does it happen with there's a cell-based vaccine called flu cell vaccine. Canine cells? Or? That's right, yeah. and Darby canine kidney cells. Right. Did you get super dog powers when you get injected with dog cells? You do. Cells? You get. Right, with. Yeah. You bark. Yeah. You bark. That's exactly what happens. And you understand okay, Fido. Good. Now you got now you I've got seen it. Beethoven one and two, Paul. So okay. you know. I know. Uh, actually, that's, so that's great. Now, one thing I want to point out, and I think this is put a quota on the whole show because we've gone an hour, and I, I, I really want to respect your time, even though I keep asking you questions because I love you so much, Paul Offit. Um, <laughs> uh, what you just said about drift and this and that and the other thing, okay, people, people. I'm going to talk to the camera for a second, which I don't do. I'm going to break the third, fourth. What wall is it, Tom Heineber? Four. Fourth wall. I'm breaking the fourth wall. <laughs> that's complicated. We have to believe in our experts in working on this. They study and work very hard to understand this expertise that not everyone can have, not every doctor can have. So this is very important that we promote the improvement in flu vaccine, we promote science, we promote more knowledge. Like you said, we're gonna know more in 10 years than we know now, as always, that's how science works. 
So Paul Offit, man, I'm so glad you could brave this nonsense, fatigue, and these two clowns in the back, which, I mean, you've only seen a third of what they can do, <laughs> <laughs> to come on the show and enlighten well, thank, us and talk to us. And so, I want to thank you personally for all that you do. And I know it's hard, and I know your family. Um, I know how hard it is on family, because my family has the same thing. Like, after this last thing where people in the comments were threatening my daughter's life and uh, saying that, you know, saying horrible things about my kids, I, a part of me is like, okay, should I not do this? And then I asked my kids, and they were like, Screw these people, Dad. They want to be mean to us. We'll show them what we can do. Give me the, give me the shot. They were gung-ho to do it because they thought it would help other kids. And they're like, kids, why can't grown-ups be that cool? How, how old are your kids? Ten and seven. That's great. Yeah. So anyways, Paul, thank you. Knock them dead tomorrow at the conference. Sure. Um, any parting words? Buy, buy the book. I'm going to tell you that. Thanks for having me on. This was fun. It was fun for getting me to see. I've seen your videos, and it's, it's just cool seeing you. See, I, I mean, I'm, I'm like a, you know, fan. That's crazy, <laughs> and I don't believe it at all. I don't believe it. <laughs> That's really, really <laughs> awesome, man. And, uh, oh, one last thing for the ZPAC. Um, if you like the kind of work we're doing here, please, please, please become a supporter. Click the button that says become a supporter. For four ninety nine a month, you get private uncensored conversations with me. We're soon going to do CME. So when I do a live show, oh, people can click a button and go through to CME. That's great. And so the bigger tribe we get, the less we ever have to worry about sponsors and commercial entanglements. We can just give you the truth and bring great guests on. Paul Offit, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We out.